Uh, welcome to this final session, uh, The New Puritans, How the Religion of Social Justice Captured the Western World. My name's Tiffany Jenkins, and I'm going to be chairing the session. It's going to run slightly different to ones you've been at earlier, in that, as you can probably guess, Andrew Doyle's book uh, is the title of the session. He's here to talk about it. He's going to talk a little bit longer than our usual panel sessions. Um, after Andrew does a, we're calling it a short lecture, but it's not really a lecture, is it? Um, an elaboration. Uh, I've got Professor Frank Frady here to respond. Now, his most recent book is The Road to Ukraine, How the West Lost Its Way. But I found uh, a different book probably most useful for this session, and I think they work quite well together. And that's the one prior to Ukraine. It's 100 Years of Identity Crisis, Culture War Over Socialization. And I think what's quite interesting and helpful about both books, really, is that um, this thing that we're involved in, whether it's the culture wars or the rise of the new Puritans, is something that thus far hasn't really been named. Uh, it's been very difficult to name, and perhaps we'll talk about a little bit about why that is. Um, it's something that we've experienced, but it's been quite difficult to get a handle on it. Uh, where does it come from? Why is it happening now? What form does it take? And these two books together give us a little bit more of a historical context that also helps us grapple with the specificities of now. So, Andrew, I'll ask you to begin, and then we'll, we'll talk. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the book. I should say as well that Frank wrote an excellent book on moral panic uh, a while ago, so that also, I think, fits into some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, so I thought that I would just give you a, a, a sort of overview of why I wrote the book and and, and what I was hoping to achieve through it. Um, it's called The New Puritans, How the Religion of Social Justice Captured the Western World. And when I talk about religion in that context, I'm, uh, of course, using an analogy, and I'm not suggesting uh, that it is a, a religion in an authentic sense. It is a means to make uh, this uh, development over the past 12 years in our culture accessible. I think one of the major problems that we face is that uh, a lot of people don't really understand what's going on and they don't necessarily understand how to describe what is going on. Because really, uh, the more work I've done on, on, on this area, the more I've realized that this is really, the culture war of the present is a battle about language and about who gets to control the meaning of words. And people are very confused. You know, they, there's this movement that has suddenly risen and accelerated at great pace that uses very progressive sounding language such as uh, anti-racism, equity, uh, they call themselves progressives. Uh, they talk about being on the right side of history and, and all of this kind of thing, and, and uh, tolerance, compassion, etc. And of course, and social justice itself. I mean that term as well. And uh, these are kind of Trojan horse terms. And often the uh, implications of the policies that they pursue are actually. Uh, the antithesis of what the language sounds like. So people are obviously very confused because we all want to say, well, we're all against racism, so we are all anti-racist, that's fine. But of course, the activists who use the term don't mean what we mean by anti-racism. If you read Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he makes this explicitly clear. Anti-racism in their discourse is this notion of uh, being proactive in the discovery of racism. And that is predicated on the notion that there are these latent power structures that run throughout society um, and, and that only if you are uh, qualified in areas such as whiteness studies or critical race theory are you able to detect them. Uh, it starts from the premise that all human interaction is underpinned in some way by white supremacy. And so therefore it has to be detected uh, in this sort of uh, sort of pseudo-religious way. It's sort of like a magical thing, it's like the Holy Spirit or something like that. Um, so in other words, we've reached a position whereby and the logical endpoint, by the way, of critical race theory is racial segregation. This is why at the American school in London, we had uh, young children segregated by skin color for after school activities. That, by the way, is the most expensive day school in, in the UK. Uh, there's a, a real correlation between um, the upper middle classes and this movement. Uh, in, in, in California, uh, we had the Brentwood School, which was segregating parents by skin color for after school uh, discussion sessions with teachers about their kids. So white, white parents would go in one room uh, and um, ethnic minority parents would go in another room. It doesn't say where the, where the mixed couples would go. Um, that wasn't made clear. Um, and I don't know how they even assessed this. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, look, it's obviously very regressive. 
uh, and it's obviously uh, a repudiation of all that the great civil rights luminaries from the 60s onwards were attempting to achieve. It's a repudiation of Martin Luther King's beautiful dream of color blindness, um, which is now often misunderstood. It, it, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't see color. It means that we don't treat people differently on the basis of color. And it's, it's a beautiful ideal that is now being destroyed. In fact, Robin DiAngelo in her book, White Fragility, problematizes this notion and, and says that it is a form of white supremacy to say to, to pursue color blindness. She's effectively saying that Martin Luther King is a white supremacist. Now, when a, uh, a white woman is saying that, there's a problem in this discourse, I think. So, um, and of course, so we are at the point where if you want to be opposed to racism, as I would like to think everyone in this room would be, if you want to be opposed to racism, you have to be opposed to anti-racism. Now, that's very, very confusing. And then there are terms such as woke. Now, this movement has come along, and what I try to outline in the book is how it is a, 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 uh, it's a kind of concatenation of various strands of academic thought derived largely from the French postmodernists of the 1960s uh, with an element of the, uh, the Frankfurt School, various ideas uh, inter intermingling. But these are interdependent strands uh, that often are influenced by each other. So queer theory would be one strand uh, uh, of this movement, critical race theory another, um, gender identity ideology, etc. Um, but there, it works like a hydro with many heads. Um, this, we, we could say it's intersectionality. Um, and this is why um, when there, these things often become interdependent. So for instance, at the, at the Tavistock Clinic, uh, members of staff were uh, invited, at the end of emails, were invited to put this black fist, the BLM symbol, against the backdrop of a rainbow progress pride flag. Uh, the, all of these things are connected. And this is why whenever someone uh, uses the, the lexicon of critical social justice, what I call critical social justice in the book, um, once they've said one thing, such as a phrase like trans women are women, or something about white privilege, you will be able to predict their opinion on every single subject, right? There, there's no deviation there. And I've never been proven wrong with this, because this is an ideology. These are not people who are thinking for themselves. These are people who are following a set of rules. Um, and of course, I'm making the case in the book for the project of social liberalism, which has been dismissed as an ideology in of itself, but of course it's not the same thing. It doesn't provide you a set of rules for how you need to behave and think. It tells you that you can think and behave in however, whatever way you want, so long as you're not infringing on the rights of others. So it's, it's not the same thing. Um, so the, the question comes down to how do we tackle this illiberal movement that calls itself liberal, this regressive movement that calls itself progressive, uh, this woke movement that is, as far as I am aware, uh, half asleep. How, how do we do these things when the language that describes it is so, is so difficult to penetrate? So the book is a, an attempt to make it accessible above all else and to sort of talk through uh, the various issues. And that's why I've drawn the analogy of religion. And very specific, because I think we understand that idea. I think we understand the idea of a belief system uh, that is largely grounded in faith or power structures, um, uh, that uh, a belief system whose practitioners will uh, excommunicate those who, who disbelieve, that seeks out heresy and punishes it in the most brutal way, uh, that can behave in the most dehumanizing and, and uh, ferocious way, but claim to be on the side of the angels. This is very uh, reminiscent of the, the, the men who would strap women to the rack back in the day, the inquisitors, uh, who thought they were doing God's work. So it is very similar. And any of you who have had any run-ins with uh, identitarian activists online will know that they are some of the most vicious people in the world, and they will wish death and pain and misery on their detractors, and then write the hashtag, be kind, afterwards. <laughs> so, you know, we are dealing with, you know, so, uh, uh, I think it's kind of unprecedented, but I was trying to find a precedent for this. And it's not original to me or particularly imaginative, but it is instructive, I think, to go back to Salem. Um, the book is called The New Puritans. I make very clear in the book that I'm not dissing Puritanism per se. Uh, in fact, there are significant differences between the Puritans of old, the Puritans of New England and the Puritans of today. I mean, the, the Puritans of old uh, had a, a continual awareness of their own um, fallibility, of their own unworthiness before God. Well, if you've ever encountered the New Puritans, they, uh, they've never doubted their own certainties and never will. Um, so it's a very different thing. But I think it's instructive because when we look back at what happened in Salem, and I don't know how much people know, people know the gist, don't they? But uh, you know, we've all seen the Crucible, 
um, which is a fairly accurate account. There were, like, you know, he took a lot of liberties with the truth, but you know, he's, a, he's an artist. Um, but the, broadly speaking, it's accurate. A group of girls in Salem Village uh, began seeing witches in every shadow and crying witch on uh, various God-fearing and, and decent people in the town. Uh, they were saying they saw them sign the devil's book. And this went to court, and these girls would have fits in court and conniptions and fainting fits, and, and they would point and scream, and they would say that they could see this woman's spirit flying out to pinch them and choke them and turning into a bird and flying up to the beam and all of this stuff. It didn't really cross the magistrate's mind, though, why a witch that was attempting to hoodwink the court and the village would be uh, attacking the girls in front of the court and the village. But, you know, this wasn't a moment of logic. And what it was, was um, the girls... All of the prosecution, there were 20 executions in the end, and five perished in prison. And these were men and women. And um, all of the convictions were secured on this notion of, of what they called spectral evidence. And spectral evidence is basically the girls saw it and claimed it to be true. We call this lived experience. This is the, the common discourse of today is this notion of lived experience. Someone says, I perceive that this, uh, this uh, misdemeanor was motivated by race or I perceive homophobia or transphobia in this situation. And that is the evidence, the accusation becomes the evidence. And that was identical then. So that's something that we have to address, this notion of, of, of lived experience. So we used to call it anecdotal evidence, of course, and we didn't used to uh, draw major conclusions on the basis, but that's all changed. Of course, when um, uh, eventually in Salem, and of course, this is the other reason I wanted to compare it, because this was a short burst of hysteria. I mean, it only lasted from February 1692 to May 1693, so a little over a year. Uh, and these were decent, intelligent, good people who suddenly became complicit in this mass hysteria. Um, the more I read about it, the more I realized that a lot of the people involved probably didn't believe it. But of course, um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the girls did believe it. Not all of them, I don't think. But People understood that when they stood up, people like Rebecca Nurse, when she stood up and said, the girls aren't telling the truth, this isn't real, she was then accused. And this is, of course, why Arthur Miller wrote the play in the 1950s, because he was drawing parallels with McCarthyism. And that's why he was, he, he said in an interview for The New Yorker that one of the reasons he wanted to write the play, what terrified him most of all, was the people who were protecting themselves by going along with the delusion. And that's similar with what happened in Salem. There were lots of examples of when the girls started crying witch on someone who was a bit too powerful. You know, uh, they, they cried which on uh, William Phipps, who was the governor of the colony, on his wife, for instance, the Reverend Hale, who becomes a character in The Crucible, they accused his wife. And in all of these cases, the magistrates just said, you've made a mistake. Um, and that is very, very revealing, I think. When they s said that the Reverend Samuel Willard was indulging in witchcraft, and he was the acting president of Harvard, they said, no, you must be mistaken. You mean Constable Willard, who you've already accused, and he's in prison. And of course, you know, if they really genuinely, authentically believed that the girls were, were, that these people were in consort with Satan and the girls were identifying it, that would never have happened. Um, there was even a case in Andover when it spread beyond Salem Town and went to Topsfield and Andover. In Andover, they accused a local dignitary who was very powerful. And he said, well, I'm going to sue you uh, for defamation. And then they shut up. So, you know, that's not the way the devil works. So th there's all sorts of reason. <laughs> He's not frightened of litigation, he's just not. Um, and so all, you know, there's all sorts of reasons for us to understand why this was not real and that people didn't believe it was real. And I like to think of the activists today, you know the sort of crazy anime avatars online who are crying and screaming about white privilege and toxic masculinity and all the rest of it. I like to compare them with the girls. They're the girls, right? They might be, a lot of them, I think they believe it. A lot of them genuinely think that there are fascists in every shadow. I think they do believe that. Um, a lot of them, you know, it's also a movement that will attract bullies because it gives you a, disc a, a cloak for your vicious behavior and you can, you can behave in the most inhumane way and be applauded for it. So obviously there's that combination of those two impulses. Um, but they are like the girls insofar as they are crying witch and screaming, etc. Had that have happened in Salem and the elites not gone along with it, no one would have died. It was the, because the magistrates and the ministers and the people in charge said, yes, the girls are authentic, and that's why people died. And I think we have a similar situation now, insofar as the activists make a lot of noise and make a lot of demands, but it wouldn't matter if we ignored them, but we don't. And people in major positions of power capitulate to their bidding. Uh, they, the, the people who do so are now uh, 
predominant in all of our major cultural, academic, and artistic institutions. They dominate in the NHS, in the police force, in the civil service, in all of those quangos, the College of Policing, uh, which trains police. And um, they are impervious to this. This is why you often see police in viral videos doing the Macarena in rainbow flags and things like that. <laughs> but it's a bit more insidious than that, of course. I mean, those things are easy to mock. But you know, when you, you know, when you have the police investigating people for non-crime, as they do routinely, uh, and when the Home Office and Pretty Patel, the Home Secretary, says to them, you have to stop doing that, and they ignore it and carry on, and then the High Court rules that it's unlawful, and they ignore that as well, and they carry on, they're out of control. They are in the grip of an ideology. And we can see evidence of this absolutely everywhere. But it's a minority. So the More in Common initiative uh, ran a study, and they discovered that 13 they estimate around 13% of people would fall into what we call the woke bracket, or that, that sort of progressive, you know, faux progressive bracket. Uh, but they dominate everywhere, so it's a minority dominating, and they particularly dominate in, in upper middle class circles and in, in the, among the elites. And that's why the comparison with Salem, I think, works well uh, and, and can be quite illuminating, uh, because the way that we will defeat this is for people will stop, uh, you know, capitulating. People in power need to stop capitulating. When you see it all the time, you know, you ask Keir Starmer, what is a woman? And you can see the fear in his eyes, and you can see he panics obfuscate, uh, well, I don't know, um, well, maybe it's a bit more complicated, a bit more nuanced, it's not nuanced, it's not complicated, it's easy, a 10-year-old could tell you, right? <laughs> but the thing about that is, you know, those politicians, this is why I think it's a great question, it's not a gotcha, it's, it's, a, it's a means to test the honesty of the ruling class. If you can't answer what is a woman, well, we all know you know what a woman is, it means you're too cowardly to do so, you're intimidated, and these people are terrifying. You know, you, these activists are really scary. They can and do ruin lives. They've developed and cultivated this system of public shaming, harassment, uh, called cancel culture. We just call, we call it cancel culture. Some people claim it's not real. Uh, and yet it has built up, built up an impressive list of casualties for a phenomenon that doesn't exist. And, and I would say that, that, that this is comparable to those cancellations of the past. In terms of, and of course, the stakes are different. No one's going to get hanged or burnt as a witch. But you can have everything taken away from you, and, it, and that's, that's very severe. Um, so that was the reason why I wanted to draw that comparison between Salem and also to a broader analogy uh, in terms of religion. Uh, and that's what I've attempted to do in the book, and also to try and explain or account for some of its origins, and also to talk about how we escape from it. And I think the lessons of Salem will teach us that, that actually there comes a tipping point where you know, mo I mean, look, all of us here probably get emails from when, when, we, when we criticize the critical social justice movement. We're often, people will email in private and say, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I understand that you're right about this, but I can't say it publicly. We are the majority on this. And it would just take the majority of people to say, it's not real. There are no witches. There aren't fascists everywhere. JK Rowling isn't a transphobe. How do we know? Because she's never said anything transphobic. That's the first clue. You know, <laughs> stop indulging in fantasies and hysteria and not be frightened of being the next to be accused. That's, that's, that's really our way out. And just on a final, I know I've been rambling, but just on a final point about that, ultimately Salem collapsed because uh, the deputy governor it was decided, after a lot of people had been killed, decided to write to the senior clergymen in the country and ask the question, is spectral evidence admissible in court? And they all said, by no means. And then all of the cases collapsed. And we have to say, lived experience is not enough. Your perception is not enough. But it is so ingrained now. I mean, if you look at the Crown Prosecution Service website, if you look at the police website, it will say that hate crime is recorded based on the perception of the victim. Firstly, it uses the word victim, which bypasses due process entirely. It should be complainant. That's a legacy of Keir Starmer's uh, time as director of public prosecutions. Uh, but it will also say that the perception is what matters. And that is now pretty much across, across the board uh, in all of these major institutions. So I think challenge the no we need to challenge the notion of lived experience. We all need to be a bit braver in saying what we know to be true. And I think this is an assault on truth. This is a hysteria like any other. Uh, and truth matters, ultimately. And we need to re-engage with those enlightenment values of reason, evidence-led epistemology, and, and not just simply uh, truckle to the bidding of screaming pink-haired loons. And that, I think, is all I need to say about that. Thank you, Andrew.
Well, I think we can assume that the people in the room think this thing exists, so we're not here to try and um, defend that. What I'd like to do, and I'll come to you, Frank, first for your, for your thoughts, is just to separate this out into what is it, let's pin it down, where has it come from, um, and what are the ways out? You've given us some ideas, but let's try and unpack that a little bit. So, Frank, I wonder if you can start. Yeah, I mean, I read the book, and I, I thought it was unusually well written, which is a good it's thing. Nice. <laughs> uh, but also because books on the subjects written by opponents of what we call cancel culture tend to be you know, cheap in the way they, make, they trivialize the opposition, the way they kind of laugh at them, the way they kind of attack their weak points rather than their strong points. And I thought Andrew avoided all that. He had a, it's a serious contribution to the discussion, which is often lacking. And I also thought you, your work on language is really quite important. The attempt to kind of control language is really critically important. And, and it seems to me that we have we still got a problem here. And the problem is, uh, was, uh, in a sense, articulated by Andrew just now earlier on when you said, you know, if, if we know what they see on toxic masculinity, we know what they will see on a number of other things. So there's something invisible that binds together a number of different views, uh, which isn't explicit. It's a, it's a hidden ideology. I call it an ideology without a name. But it, it's so powerful that it's managed to capture the language. And, I th and the language itself is really important here because um, the language that... Uh, uh, they use is self-consciously opaque. I mean, if you look at the most important words in the woke vocabulary, it's like, I feel uncomfortable. You know, what does that mean, uncomfortable? I feel uncomfortable when I'm sitting on a piece of ice or something like that. But what they're getting is, is like a mood, or they don't say right or wrong, they say this is inappropriate. Or when you look at some of the other words, they, you know, it's, this is problematic. Hmm. I mean, if you look at every single word, it's, it's a euphemism, it's opaque, and you, it's like a bar of soap, a verbal bar of soap in your hand that goes right through it. And uh, it seems to me that, you know, sort of, that makes it so difficult to nail it down and indicate, you know, what it is that we're talking about. I think that uh, uh, I'm in a very privileged position because I'm the oldest person in the room. <laughs> and, I, I, and I lived through every single phase of this development. And it actually begins at a, much, a little bit earlier because I remember when the gay liberation movement, and I was actively supporting the gay li liberation movement, at a certain point stopped talking about being a homosexual and stopped talking about who you slept with and became a kind of identity. And that, that identity itself then became much more important mm -hmm. than who you slept with or you know, what you were inclined to do. And with the passing of time, you have this continuous ratcheting up of the subjective identity element of that. Now, the one thing that you might not know of is that over the last 30 years, almost every year somebody has said, when is this gonna stop? You know, and people will say, it's a fad, it's gonna go away, uh, you know, don't worry about it, PC is a myth, you know, this is just gonna go away. Well, it's not stopping. And I think the reason why it's not stopping is, is because of what Andrew is focused on, where the problem is not the what people call snowflakes, which is a horrible term, or you know, what people call these young kids, the gen younger generations, but the very fact that it's the elite itself that has made it its own. If you look at what's been happening in the United States, there was a time when there were sectors of elite institutions that were immune from this pressure. I remember debating in New York pe with people, and, and, and I would say, it's gonna spread everywhere. And I said, you're wrong, Frank. Business is never going to accept these values. Well, you know what business is like now. It's like the Ben and Jerry's of this world that are not just a minority, every single big corporation has taken that on board. And people actually say that they're just doing it because they want to make money. But actually, when you talk to the executives of these companies, they read the Harvard Business Review. That's what they were brought up on. And what are the values of the Harvard Business Review? It's, it's precisely the same. So it's, it's not a, a temporary kind of phenomenon. And, then they said, oh, it will never go into sports. You know, sports will be totally immune from these horrible woke values. Well, today, every, every sport is taking the knee with monotonous regularity. I mean, taking the knee has become a sport itself. You know, sort of who does it longest and, uh, and who does it most often. So you have a, a kind of problem here. And I think the, the, the problem that I, I'm trying to get at, and this is precisely what I like us to, I, I would love to have Andrew's 
views on this. I don't think that uh, unlike uh, the Puritan experience, where, where, as you said, there's a tipping point, mm -hmm. there's a tipping point to this. You I, don't? I don't. And I think the reason for that is because although some of the peoples in the elites are doing it because they feel pressured, they're too scared to open their mouths, it's now become this hysteria that you described, mm -hmm. it's now become institutionalized. And there are laws that have been passed. You know, a lot of laws have been passed to kind of protect this. And there's a veritable industry that kind of has built itself upon perpetuating and reproducing this. And, and worse still, this is my biggest worry, the younger generations, you know, the, the kids that are now in school, are being indoctrinated in this. And for them, this is normal. You know, if, if it, for them, it's normal, for example, uh, that, you know, there is no such thing as a man and a woman. Yeah. I mean, only an idiot would say something like that. That's what they learn in school. And when you have generation after generation deeply, um, you know, thinking that this is the norm, plus it being institutionalized, we have a, a bigger problem here than, than we suspect. And that basically means that the kind of uh, things you were calling for, courage, standing up, being brave, is all the more important. Because I, I do think that this can be fought. I mean, the, you know, we can demonstrate that the emperor has got no clothes, but it's not going to go away by itself. It's not going to go away until there's a, a cohort of individuals, and we're nowhere near that yet, who are prepared to unite together and just make fun of this. Humor is very important in this. Uh, are prepared to be counted in difficult circumstances. And, 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 and even countenance the possibility that you will lose your job, you will lose your reputation. I mean, these are really scary but really important accomplishments that we've got to normalize because the, the enemy is much more uh, deeply entrenched, I think, than a lot of people imagine. Can I just ask before I ask yeah. you, Andrew, Frank, you said um, that there's, there's a key moment when great gay rights move from being, I suppose, uh, a political demand to almost a personal as affirmation. Is that, was that right? right? Can, you, can you talk about that a little bit more, what that means and how it showed itself? I, I think the way you can see it, it's even clearer in, in, in feminism. Feminism begins as a women's liberation movement, which, again, I whole, wholeheartedly support. It was about liberating women, giving them freedom, giving them, you know, recognizing that they're equal human beings. And the demands, the first five demands of the women's liberation movement, I totally support. But at a certain point, that feminism turned into what's called cultural feminism. And that was the same time that uh, you know, people who were involved in gay liberation began to look upon uh, sort of uh, their experience in a slightly more subjective, identity-related basis. So what mattered now, you know, you were defined uh, by your sexuality. Not the fact that you were a poet, you were an artist, you were a novelist, which is what, I was a homosexual artist, I was a homosexual pianist, but now you were, you were like, that being gay was more important, because that was your identity than what you did in the external world. And I think that happened in every single, in, in, the, in the black liberation movement, happened at the same time around, it, it began to kick in around 78, 79, mm -hmm. and this, it, was, it was fought is back. This, is this a sort of personal, is political? You say that that kind of catchphrase becomes... Yeah. The first, first usage of the term personal is political in a, in a book is in 1971. And at that point, people make fun of it. They think this is a joke. By the time you get to the end of the 1970s, people take it deadly seriously. And from that point onwards, it becomes, you know, sort of, you know, a completely, you know, taken for granted view in certain quarters. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the key moment. I'm um, sorry, would you, and then would you say, because Andrew writes a lot about uh, the Foucault and the critical queer theory and everything, which is obviously, in, it becomes sort of institutionalized around the same time. And it strikes me that the two, the, the kind of the political movements are happening at the same time, really, as the sort of institutionalization of it in academia. So you it get is. sort of two yeah, problems. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, the way I look at it and is that, and I could be wrong, is that the reason why these academic views take off and flourish it's because the cultural terrain has been created where they, could, you know, where, where they could be easily cultivated. In other words, the mood, the zeitgeist, has been established in the 70s, and therefore all these you know, you know, outwardly idiotic ideas begin to take over and gain hegemony over the, over the ac ac academia. And now today, if you challenge it, then you're seen as like, you know, they, they, they always will use the expression, Frank, you don't get it. 
Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> or I get it as what I had to say. Or I say, I get it, but you're yeah. fucking wrong, is what I usually, <laughs> <laughs> I usually tell them, yeah. <laughs> so when did, because a lot of that earlier stuff is certainly in the language of liberation, um, those political movements from the 70s, they are talking about liberation and freedom. Um, are we seeing what Douglas Murray has suggested, which is just, it's just went too far? So Douglas Murray's book, am I thinking of the right? Yeah, um, the overcorrection idea. The overcorrection. Yeah. So is it just progressivism gone mad? No. So why not? I, I think Douglas, a lot of people think there's a, there's a kind of continuity mm. in the sense that these were, because they, what they really assume is that these were bad ideas to begin with. And therefore, these bad ideas were all right when they were moderate and temperate, but at a certain point, they acquired this uh, more nefarious quality. I think we need to make a distinction between the positive uh, aspiration for liberation, for being an equal person in society, which is entirely positive. That can never go too far. Uh, the very idea that you imagine that wanting to be equal and taken seriously can go too far means you don't understand the origins of that aspiration. So I think a lot of people read history backwards and develop a teleology of wokeness that somehow is inbuilt into the system and was gradually moving in that direction. Andrew, do you have any thoughts? Lots. OK, let's have, let's have a... Uh, let's have a uh, that's quite a lot to, to think know. about there. Um, thinking, about, thinking about origins and tipping... I know Frank said there isn't a particular tipping point, but how we got here, and then we yeah. will go out to the audience and talk about how we get out of here. I mean, that's, I have to say, I mean, that's a really scary thing that Frank said, which is that the, that tipping point thing may not happen. Um, and, you know, I have good days and bad days on this. I'm, I'm not sure which way <laughs> it will go. But I think you might be right. I think this is a crucial time at the moment because... At the moment, there are ways to fight it, insofar as a lot of the courts have been captured, but the high courts generally haven't. So what normally happens is you will have a case, uh, for the Maya Fostata case is a very good example, or the Harry Miller case, where something goes the wrong way, and then when it goes to the high courts, it is overturned. But what happens when the very highest uh, elements of these cultural bodies become captured? That's what I, if they get captured, there probably is no way back. So, for instance, we are now starting, you know, we, for a long time, I'm sure you'll agree, Frank, for a long time people thought this was going to be confined to the humanities. I mean, my background's in English literature. And when I was studying English literature at university, Foucault was a deity, was considered a complete, a, a god. And I mean that, I mean, there was even a book by a man called David M. Halperin called Saint Foucault towards a gay hagiography. So he was, you know, you couldn't really, I mean, people just didn't question uh, the, the, what, what he was talking about. It, would, it, would, it was seen as baffling um, to do so. Um, so, but then what happens when it, 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 it leaks out of the humanities and into the sciences, say? So we always used to think that mathematics and science would be impervious uh, to this kind of stuff, right? We did. I think most people did. And then now, you know, I, I cite this in my book. There was a, uh, a case recently in New Zealand uh, where the New Zealand government decided that in science classes, they ought to teach not just evolution, but alongside that, the creation myths of indigenous tribes, including one creation myth that says that uh, the rain that falls from the sky are the teardrops of a certain goddess. And that will be taught along, this is another way of knowing. And this will be taught alongside the truth. So, and will be taught with equal merit. Um, now that's scary. When one academic, a number of academics wrote an open letter saying, look, of course we respect cultural traditions. They did all the usual stuff they had to say. And it was, you know, and that, you know, people are entitled to their beliefs, all the rest of it, but this has no place in a science classroom. And that they were then demonized and attacked. I think someone lost their job for defending science in a science class. What happens when medical journals, leading medical journals, are now writing articles about how sex is a spectrum? Well, I, even I know that it's not. And I barely scraped a GCSE in biology, and yet I know more about biology than the leading biologist in the world on this particular issue. That should never happen, right? It's, it's, and and that's a, so it's when it's leaked into those top tiers you have this legitimation crisis at that point because we, 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 you can't roll that back or challenge that if the leading experts in the world are telling you are disseminating a fantasy on the, uh, grounded in ideology. Which leads us to the question of, so why in, what, does, what do institutions benefit and why do disciplines, rigorous disciplines, science, maths, why do they embrace this? Can I just say something small here, which is, Andrew just said that at the moment the courts, you know, 
are, are problematic, but there are some areas where mm. you can get a good result. But what happens if the highest section of the courts get corrupted That's what like I'm this? saying. Exactly. So if you look at the, you know, the judges in the courts, where do they get trained? What's the curriculum that they were brought up on? And you'll find that in almost every, uh, every legal scholar these days, every a law school in the country, including the most prestigious ones in Britain and the United States, uh, are promoting uh, critical legal studies where they uh, push these kind of ideas as, as, as today's modern version of what the law should be. Uh, and it's interesting because, for example, if you want to be a, a police officer at the highest level uh, and you want to be a commissioner, for example, or even an inspector, you get sent on these courses run by these people where they get imbued by precisely the same kind of ideals. So the top police people are likely to be more corrupted by this than the ordinary guys on the beat. And when it comes to the legal system, you're not getting this new generation of lawyers. And there are a few now in the Supreme Court in the United States who were brought up on this. And this is their notion of what the law is. So we do need to understand that this is not going to get better in the legal system, just simply because people are coming in who have been brought up on these. Well, um, J uh, Jackson, the latest appointee to the Supreme Court, was asked, what is a woman? What is it? And she wasn't sure. She yeah. said, I'm not a biologist. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it, is, so it is creeping into the exactly. higher levels. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's my fear, is that, and I think maybe one of the strategies might be, I mean, I don't know, I don't know the answers, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but one of the strategies okay. might, well, it might be through the government. You know, all of this has happened, in our country at least, under Tory rule. Over the last 12 years, they've done nothing. They, they, they spoke about things like a war on woke, which never materialized. It's just, it's just empty, empty rhetoric. Yeah, worse than labor. And, and, you know, so let's take the College of Policing. I think this would be a very good example. Now, and I think anyone in this room, if you'd have said to you 15 years ago, if you imagine what you were like 15 years ago, someone said to you, oh, in, 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 by 2022, the police will be routinely investigating people for non-crime and recording this against their name. No one would have believed it, no one. And now it's really, really normal and commonplace. But look what happened there. As I say, they were instructed to stop and they didn't by the government. And the, the government just let them go. Why didn't they just abolish the College of Policing? Right? I mean, that's really what would have to happen. You'd have to have people, you know, Kemi Badenoch would have been a good step forward because Kemi stood up in, in Parliament and made, the, made it clear that the teaching of critical race theory as uncontested fact in schools is illegal. It's against the Education Act. So, still going on. You know, we had the Royal Borough of Greenwich recently disseminating a, an inclusive language guide to schools, which said that we should avoid words such as he and him and she and her. And it even went so far as to explicitly misrepresent the Equality Act by saying that when the Equality Act talks about sex as a protected characteristic, it really means gender identity. So it's just lying about the law. And that's now gone to teachers, it's gone to parents, that's why it's become, gone back in the news now. So, if they're just going to ignore what the government says, we need a stronger government. Basically, I think that might be it. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> um, I'm going to come out to the audience. I just want to say one thing from my perspective. I do a lot of work on cultural institutions, and I have done for many, many years. And they have, over decades, taken on some of these ideas. And there is that kind of generational shift. But what really struck me about it is those defending principles of sort of research, dissemination, education, have become very weakened and quiet. Um, and in a way, their kind of incorporation of these new values is a way to the, for the institution to prove its worth, to show that it's purposeful, to give it some sort of legitimacy. So I think that's one reason why they take these things on, but also why one reason is to go back to first principles and to the values, what you talk about, in either liberalism or enlightenment principles, because you have to sort of strengthen those as well as fight this. Well, I, I mean, it's to go back to this idea of the universities as being a, a, a forum for the production of knowledge and, 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 and stepping towards the truth. I mean, Peter Bogosian talks about this idea of idea laundering. Uh, and it, it can be careerist as well, I think. So, for instance, let the, the, one of the examples he gives is the example of uh, fat studies, which sounds like a joke. Sounds like I've just made that up, but it's not. It's a real discipline. And, and at the core of this discipline is that obesity is not connected to poor health. Um, what it is, it's a sort of uh, cis, heteropatriarchal, white uh, discourse, which has come out of medical science, uh, which is there to oppress people of a different body sh shape. 
Uh, in order to reach that conclusion, you have to deny decades and decades of research into the subject of obesity and its link to diabetes and, and cancer, etc. cetera. Um, but the way it works through idea laundry is you get a group of academics, they have this idea, they create a, a journal called Fat Studies Monthly, and then they publish, <laughs> they publish these speculations in this journal, and then these people start quoting each other, and they give this illusion of incontrovertibility, and by the end of it, you've got a new, a new truth which is backed up by academic journals and is now supported uh, by the, the people at the top of university. So, and that is what he means by idea laundering. At the end, you come out with this lies as truth through the academic system. Uh, so what do you do with that? I don't know how you, do, how you deal with that, but well, that is what's happening. Well, one of the, I think you're absolutely right, and the conclusion that I've drawn is that when I read a newspaper article that begins with research shows, yeah. You know, I basically make the point that research shows nothing. You know, we have to interpret what that research is, not assume that there is a, a fact, an incontrovertible fact that comes out of this. And we just need to popularize the idea of skepticism, which is, mm. you know, which is got a very bad name at the moment, being in denial and skeptical is seen as being very, very bad. But that's, from the Enlightenment world, being skeptical and promoting skepticism is one of the best things that we can do. Yeah. Because, you know, because it, it, especially for young people, if you're idealistic, being skeptical comes naturally. And instead of sitting on it, I think we should just have the idea, let it flourish, let us question everything, particularly the, the oh. stuff they learn in universities. But why is it, if I could just ask Frank, um, sorry, if I could, I just, why is it that people in universities, academics, are so susceptible to this idea of, of having, holding these certain orthodoxies that they can't challenge. When I was at university, uh, and I was doing a lot about queer theory and gender and sexuality in the Renaissance period, and it was a shibboleth, it was just accepted as a fact because Foucault, or the, the, the people who came in, in, in the wake of Foucault, had decided that the notion of homosexuality did not exist before the word came into being in the late 19th century medical discourses. So until you had this word, homosexual, there were no homosexuals which is not true, um, but it was just decided and accepted, and then they would all quote each other, and, and, and but no one sort of stopped to say, hang on a minute, um, why was Richard Barnfield writing love poems from one man to another uh, back in the 16th century? Why was Shakespeare writing love poems from one man to another, for that matter, at that time? Um, maybe he was gay, right? So, but, but they just said, no, he can't be gay, because there was no word, because they see the world, as you know, they see our understanding of reality is wholly constructed through the language that describes it. That's the, the core of that postmodernist idea. Well, I think what you say is important because for the very same reason that that happened in the humanities is also the same reason why, you know, hardcore mathematicians and hardcore scientists in physics are now rolling over and are, uh, are looking at decolonizing the uh, physics curriculum and, and, and looking into... Newtonian laws as having a racist component yeah. to it. And, it, and you think that either they are they are just they just become schmucks. They took a schmuck tablet <laughs> and, and and kind of uh, become like that. Or alternatively, you 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 realize that there's a intellectual cowardice that that kind of masquerades as being sensitive. Yeah. And I think that has become so deeply in, ingrained in academic culture. You know, you know it, amongst my students, and I'm, I'm just leaving now entirely the university system, about 35 to 40 percent of them will tell you, can I say this? They come up to you, Frank, can I say that? And when you think about it, I don't know about what you were like when you were a university student, you said what you wanted. Yeah. The, the idea that you have to ask permission to say something yeah. was unthinkable, whereas now for them, you know, self-censorship just, you know, just comes with the territory. I think it's cowardice, which has become uh, acceptable as this is the way academics behave. This is our culture. But, but without trying to um, go all psycho become like a psychologist, do you, not, do you think that they know they're falsifying? No. They're being untrue? No, I, this, is the, this is the disturbing thing. Many of them, I mean, this goes back to the Puritan uh, business. Uh, many of them have actually do believe that they see devils and horrible things. Uh, they actually think that, you know, being masculine, toxic masculinity, is a, is, is a real phenomenon. They actually believe that there are 100 different genders. And even you ask them, well, can't, you know, well, okay, you mentioned three, what's the other 97? 
right? They struggle to give you an answer to it, but they, act, but they still believe that there are countless genders, and that's because the power of, uh, of conformism, the, the, the pressure, the institutional pressure, is such that either you become a liar, which is very difficult for most people to live with yourself, or you become like them, and they've really changed. I mean, I know colleagues used to have a lot of brains, a lot of brain cells. They kind of sound like something out of an Orwellian, you know, sort of theater plot. And the lack of discussion affirms that, because they're not under, under any any yeah, and Just on that, no we have got to watch, we, do, we don't become like them. I mm -hmm. think it's quite important, like in this room, we obviously agree, but we shouldn't flatter ourselves that, that this is the end of the matter, because we have got to be questioning, are we good enough in terms of argument to take them on, you know, rather than just letting rip. We have got to be much more demanding on ourselves to come up with better ideas and better ways of, of, of fighting against them. Okay, I'm going to go out to the audience. Hi, I'm, I'm so glad I'm being here and listen to so many interesting opinions. But I'm thinking about the religion of so, social justice. It doesn't mean all the um, religion of social justice is not so good. But consider of the dark side, because when I was young, I remember I read the book, it's very classic. It talk about how to define uh, this woman is a witch or not. It said, put a fire on her if she's, well, if she's true, not, not a witch, and the fire is representative of God, and God will protect her, not be burned. But if she's been burned, she's a witch. So when I read these books, and I think, it's ridiculous. But at that time, people really believe it and use it as a guidebook to execute so many innocent women. And when I think about that, I, I try to connect deeper link with the situation now. So I'm thinking uh, when people panic, people believe rubbish. And the reason people panic because they fear. And fear is like a disease. They will poison people's brain and mm -hmm. force them to believe something they, they shouldn't believe. For example, um, this recently they have the pandemic, right, the COVID. And because I'm from China, I know some Chinese people, there is some wrong medicine. You know, when they, when they come down, they think it's stupid, but they still do it. So what I'm thinking is how to escape from this. Actually, we need to, we need to think about how to escape from fear as a disease. So this is my question. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, could I ask the panel if they think um, sociology has twisted people's brains? <laughs> and maybe it would be a good idea to abolish sociology as a subject? <laughs> I think it's really uh, incredible, really, that um, you, the government might say, you have to do this, you can't do that, you can't in the College of Policing uh, teach this and behave that way with the public, yet they still do. And this, this kind of suggests to me that the nature and the character of where power lies and where the elites are and the character of those has changed. And I wonder if part of it is just a disbelief and a, a lack of belief in, um, in democracy and democratically elected power structures which we can hold to account. And I just would like to understand more about what you guys think of that subject. I was just wondering if you could sort of offer some insights as to why social justice is sort of becoming more of a middle class sort of phenomenon. And I sort of say this on the background of you know, the sort of schoolgirl who chucked a, a tin of soup at the Van Gogh uh, painting last week, it's now been revealed that she attends a 15 grand a term sort of private school and uh, you don't really sort of see sort of working class um, sort of people doing this. So why is this sort of overwhelmingly more middle class? Uh, so these days I've been reading John Gray, who is an English philosopher that, whose work exposes uh, limits and problems within liberalism and progressivism almost of a dark side of these conditions. And uh, recently he's been talking about the fact that um, this woke culture uh, might be employed as a tactical warfare in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense that the US is essentially uh, um, employing this culture to uh, propagate cultural imperialism. And he says that it might actually be a good thing in relation to uh, women's liberation, let's say in the Middle East, but I was wondering whether you had any comments on this uh, thesis. 
Yeah, just a question. Um, there was a case recently you may have seen where uh, a, a guy in the Navy was accused of sexual assault of a man. And the description of the act seemed to be sexual assault, um, kissing someone and hugging him and stuff without consent. But he, the um, alleged perpetrator said that he was demisexual and therefore did not feel sexual attraction without emotion. And therefore, and he won the case. And it's interesting because <laughs> this, the argument that you said rightly, Andrew, at the beginning, that it's all based on how the person perceives um, an interaction, that's usually the standard. Um, but actually, in this case, it didn't matter how the, the victim perceived it. it, it the, the, the perpetrator didn't deny the act. He just said, I didn't mean it in a sexual way. Essentially, that's what he meant by saying he's demisexual. And I thought, I was quite shocked that the courts allowed that. So it's almost like a kind of falling in on itself of this um, ideology. But I, yeah, it's one case, but it could be you know, interesting. Thanks. I've been trying to figure out why these terrible ideas have got such fertile ground now and not 10, 20 years ago. And I'm thinking, is it, because, is it as kind of Peter Turchin points out, there's too many elites and elite aspirants for the, that can be supported by the economy so they're sort of thinking to themselves, well, let's turn over the whole system and then maybe we'll be running it, and that these ideas are very good in terms of them gaining power. The people who want to be in power and don't look as though they're ever going to be in power may get to power by repackaging Marxism in this way. And, it's, and, and if we had less elite aspirants and a less competition to be elite, then maybe this would start to subside, and perhaps it will only subside when the population goes down and the, and the economy recovers. Uh, Frank, I agree with the last point. Um, I think those of us who are critical of woke need to be careful not to fall into the same trap where if you hear one anti-woke uh, point of view, you can predict all the rest. And I think there's been a little bit of a risk at moments during this festival. Um, but, um, uh, Andrew, you mentioned White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. I, I read that a while back trying to be open-minded about it and, and trying to think why is it that this book is hitting such you know, a chord with so many people who are reading about it or being given training sessions about it at work. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that it appeals to the sense that there are political injustices in the world and maybe we're not personally doing enough about them. We probably all feel that. Um, and I think you know, it would be a good idea for people to be more in active in politics, but you might hope that instinct might translate to trying to understand about the world more, read about it, debate it, etc., etc. But instead, what D'Angelo does is she goes straight to saying, this is why it's happening, this is what you should do about it. Um, it's basically a ready-made bundle of problem and solution. And any other answer means you're part of the problem, not the solution. So how can we do better than D'Angelo and the, her, her ilk appealing to that positive instinct that's out there of wanting to engage politically? I do want to, one of you to answer the class point. Is there a class okay. difference? Um, I mean, so on that, I mean, that, that footage of the, uh, the two girls throwing soup at the Van Gogh and then, you know, gluing their hands to the wall and speak. And, you know, the first thing that strikes you is they were so plummy. They were the poshest people I've ever seen. Uh, they may as well be wearing tiaras. So, uh, yes, it's, it does strike us. And often uh, some of the most vociferous cheerleaders of this movement have double barreled surnames and are very uh, privately educated. A lot of this stuff takes hold much quicker in the elite institutions. It certainly has at Oxford and Cambridge or in the Ivy League in America. There's something that connects affluence with this, this uh, movement. In terms of what it is, I think it's to do with potentially, and I don't know, but potentially a failure of the, le of, of the left. It's the, the cultural turn in left-wing thought, where we go away, and it feeds into what Frank was saying, it, where we, they, they replace money with identity. You know, when that happened, this is why I don't believe the woke movement is a left-wing movement in any sense at all, because there is no real interest in in, in, in redressing economic inequality, or they often see the working class people as part of the problem, in, in fact. Um, I think that's really at, at the heart of it. You know, I mean, if you take the example of quotas, just to give a quick point, you know, in, in, implementing quotas at the BBC in terms of skin colour, what, what you end up with is a lot of uh, posh ethnic minority people doing, getting the jobs, right? If you were to institute a quota based on how many people go to private school, which is 7% of the country, and say that no more than 7% of the BBC's staff uh, could, go to, could have been privately educated, 
then you would automatically solve all of those other issues regarding race, et cetera, because racial minorities tend to be overrepresented in poor income brackets. But they're not interested in class. They're not interested in, in economic inequality. That's where the corporate world, I mean, look, you've got left -wing, supposedly left-wing activists cheering on multi-billion dollar corporations to decide the acceptable parameters of thought and speech. That doesn't make it, it's incoherent, in fact. So I think maybe because this culture war has been mischaracterized as left versus right, and false, that's a false characterization, that also makes it harder to fight, mm -hmm. I think. Frank. In 1958, C.W. Wright Mills wrote an important book called The Power Elite. And when he talked about the power elite, he talked about three elites. One was the economic elite, the other was the political elite, and the third was the military elite. C.W. Wright Mills did not talk about a cultural elite. He didn't think it was important. He talked about the media in passing, but that was it. Now today, you know, if I was to write his book, uh, the military elites are conspicuously irrelevant in British you know, society. The economic elite is still quite important. The political elite isn't as important as before because the cultural elites are the dominant sections of, of, of the elites at the moment to the point at which they can influence the behavior of the other sections of the establishment, the new establishment. And that relates to the question, well, you know, why are laws broken? I think the reason why the laws are broken is because the political elite is weaker than the cultural elite. I mean, just, you know, the, the media barks, and then the politicians jump. We have noticed that, you know, the media says, oh, look at Johnson, he's not taking the lockdown seriously. Next day, Johnson rolls over. The media says, oh, Liz Truss is, 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 has an ideological you know, sensibility about economics. A day later, there's a U-turn. And I think that what has happened is that the cultural section of the elites have, a, have a, established a hegemonic position and are in a position to influence the other sections of the establishment to the point at which you know, sort of they are in, in the driver's seat. And there's a, a lot of good stuff written on this, particularly in relation to language about how that has occurred. And I think that's the key, that's the answer. So the, 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 the major target that we have to kind of visualize is the cultural section of the establishment, because they're the ones that wield the most amount of influence, and they're the ones that created all the stuff that Andrew writes about. They're the ones that have constructed and invented it and shaped it uh, in the way that it exp uh, is experienced. And hopefully that answers your question about sociologists. No, they're not. They're, they're never more necessary. They're not all schmucks. <laughs> yeah, so, <yeah. laughs> so we've got a lot of people who want to speak, so let's try and keep it quick. Yes, madam. Uh, yes. Uh, could you just quickly go back to what Tiffany asked you, and that is how um, the kind of politics um, established itself as a kind of making or oh, institutions um, tried to stay relevant and then adopted these kind of policies. They don't, you know, they wanted to stay relevant, modern. If you go through a, a, the academy or universities, they don't know how to think about modernity or innovation. They just think, oh, yeah, we're sort of the only thing they can think about is, you know, diversity and, and stuff like this. And I think um, calling a work a religion is, is more than an analogy. I think you're spot on there. Um, Andrew, it is, as sociologists sometimes define it as the ultimate concern, which is what Frank was saying, that th this is so important that it overrules legislation and politicians. That's why the media, um, as priests of this religion, had so much power and can eject Boris and may eject Liz, Tr Liz Truss, if they like. Um, but going back to how Andrew started, looking at the, the Puritans and their infallibility, made me think about the moral gap. and. If we think of the highest and the lowest, um, under the Christianity which built our culture, um, the standard of good is right up there with God, and none of us come close. And then down at the bottom, I mean, I can look down on Joe Stalin and Adolf Hitler, <clears throat> but actually me and Joe and Adolf are much closer together than, than I am to God, unfortunately. And so that is inherently the, the uh, humility we have in Christianity, whereas with woke, the woke are right up there and anyone who disagrees with them are right down in the basement. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they can look with such divisiveness um, compared to Christianity, which unites us. We're all humble, we're all making mistakes, and we just cannot look down on people in the way the woke are now looking down on those who dissent. 
So you talked at the beginning about counterculture, and basically one of the ways to defeat this is for people to develop the courage to fight against it and be honest about it. And we've talked about institutions a lot, but from an individual level, why do you think people who have the means to fight this to um, fight this cancel culture? By means, I'm talking financial means, like millionaires, more millionaires, well-known artists, etc. Why are why even though they've got the means to fight this cancel culture and live a fruitful life, why are they not doing it? Because even if they're cancelled, they could live a fruitful life. They could be on an island or whatnot, but yet they're still following instructions. So why is it our case on an individual level? Um, Right at the beginning, you were talking about the importance of language, and it, it, it's always struck me that uh, the woke uh, op have a language that operates on two levels. Um, at the most extreme, there are, there are what you might call the curse words, uh, racist, you know, it's a voodooistic word that, that, that frightens people just by its mere utterance, uh, hate, uh, bigot. The, and the, the, all these words follow a pattern that they're short. And, and, and just a, a single continent and, and, and vowels. They, they, but, but their purpose is to frighten people uh, simply by, by the fact of the reference. And uh, the word bigger that I mentioned I actually mean, just means, it, it properly means someone who's so certain of their own right, uh, correctness that they refuse to argue with, 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 any, with anybody else. It's not about the views you hold, it's about the way you hold them. And, and it's a perfect uh, description of, of the woke, woke mentality. Um, and, and, and the correct response to being uh, called a bigot is, is not to say, no, I'm not. It's to say, well, what's your definition of that word? And what is your justification given that definition? And that, that is what will make uh, you know, the people shy away from you. That is what will neutralize that word. But beyond that, there's what you might call the, the, the pseudo-scientific vocabulary these people have, uh, which is derived, I think, from, from the old Marxist analytical worldview. And, and, and a prime example of that, of course, is, is all the phobias they, 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 they have, you know. Because a phobia is, is, a, is a technical medical term. It means a fear of a physical situation or thing. It's a completely uh, it, it, uh, incorrect uh, mis misapplication of that, that term to apply it to an attitude or, 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 or a belief. And, and, and with respect to Andrew, um, the reason why you don't take things far enough because you, if you try to use, deny the use of that word, if you say this isn't transphobic, this isn't Islamophobic or whatever, you're actually still vindicating that use of language. Um, to, to, if I can just finish up with one sentence. The reason J.K. Rowling is not a transphobe is not because she's never said anything transphobic. It's because there is no such thing as transphobia. Thank you. Can you pass it to the man with lots of hair? I really do want to get you in, so everybody has to be quite quick. Behind, behind, behind. Yes, sir. So the, the only reason I'm commenting is because my girlfriend Hannah wanted me to do so. But <laughs> since I'm speaking, so here is my personal lift experience, just to pick up on that term. I recently joined an online community of investors. I'm not one of them. I'm a business trying to get money. And then I saw everyone put their pronouns in their profile. And I did so too. I put he, him, and him, or I don't even know, he, he and him there. And I don't agree with any of it. I completely agree with most people in this room, but I've still caved and done it, and I don't know why. Well, I want the money at the end of the day. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I'm pissed at myself, but I've still done it. <laughs> um, it, it. We've heard a lot of really interesting and potent poetic imagery to help us try and unpack the situation we're in and understand it more deeply. I'd like to add another onto that pile, if I may, uh, which comes from the late, great Isaiah Berlin, one of our great philosophical minds. He wrote a lot about liberty, and one of his greatest ideas, I think, is one of his simplest ideas, is that liberty has two central pillars, one of which is freedom and one of which is equality. And the reason uh, that we get into so many arguments concerning liberty and what it means is because we assume that those two pillars are complementary when in fact they're contradictory. So when you increase freedom, you reduce equality. When you increase equality, you reduce freedom. Uh, and so I wonder whether finding a solution to this problem is about actually finding an appropriate balance and a compromise. And I'd be interested to know what Andrew and Frank think that might look like. Uh, I come from the United States, and in the American context, this social, political, ideological phenomenon has become actually deadly. 
And so as an outsider here, I find it actually quite, in a way, kind of cute and cuddly that the, the manifestation here has been things that are annoying, like vandalism with paint, fortunately no permanent damage, blocking streets. What I saw, like in my home city of Portland, Oregon, was literally neighborhoods sat on fire, people bringing knives and guns with impunity in maiming people and even killing somebody in my city, all under the name of so-called social justice, anti-racism, anti-fascism. I'm wondering if it, it, the way that it's manifested in the United States is unique to the US in that it's not something, for example, that is inherent in sort of the ideolo uh, logical conclusion in this ideology. I agree with so much that Andrew and Frank said, but I think it's ironic, Andrew, that you took Foucault to task for one of his more insightful things he said, mm. uh, which is his observation that re relatively recently there's been a shift in, uh, in homosexuality from being something that you do to being something that you are. And although he may not have been quite correct the way he formulated and expressed that, I think there's a profundity there that is actually related in interesting ways to Frank's observations about changes in the gay liberation movement in the 1970s. So we should engage with Foucault seriously sometimes. Yeah, I, yeah. anyway, I, I like that point about Foucault. Madam, yes. Thanks. Um, I, Ron DeSantis in Florida has recently uh, passed the Parental Rights and Education Bill where he's set limits and said, no, you cannot teach uh, uh, sex education before, I think it's age 10. Um, and, uh, and, and I, th I actually think it's great. Um, and I, uh, my worry is that unless we, unless we suppress the, what these people are doing, they will not stop. But I worry because I worry about, you know, where is the line between asserting authority and authoritarianism? I wondered if you could comment on that. Okay, I, uh, I teach at the Sunday Times University of the Year. Not sure why, you could look it up. Um, but this year, unusually, I've got a, a student who joined the civil service fast stream. He's a nice kid, middle of the road, 2-1. And you kind of think, uh, I wonder how that happened. Uh, he does tick all the right boxes, ethnic minority, uh, gender issues, let's call them, uh, and, and, a, and a very challenging family background. I'm not sure that he played on that. I suspect they thought that far more important than he did. But I, I'm just curious, to me, this guy is now going to be in the Ministry of Defense and the Foreign Office and the Home Office in a short, short period of time. They're the cultural elites, too. We shouldn't imagine that the cultural elite simply means the media and commentators and, you know, the civil service are part of this cultural elite. In the sport of cricket, the role of batsmen has recently been abolished, and batsmen are now always referred to as batters a rather unfortunate expression that always makes me think of fish being fried. And you <laughs> so long as it's not batty, that wouldn't be allowed. You just wonder what's going to happen next. I mean, presumably the fielding position of third man will become third person. And as for the maiden over, which is one from which the batsman doesn't score, I guess that's just going to have to be abolished completely. <laughs> but my, my, my point is that all of these woke developments, whether it's the control of language or more serious developments, are actually all seen as barking mad by most ordinary people. And that what really explains the development of wokery, and particularly the way in which it has captured all of our public institutions and places of authority, is the complete undermining of democracy. Because the views of ordinary people have been completely erased from this debate and silenced on the grounds of use of language like racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on and so forth. And so it's, it's easy to state, but the, uh, the solution to this problem is that we just have to re-energize our democracy and ensure that actually all of these decisions are taken on the basis of consent, because if they are, a lot of this woke nonsense will disappear. Okay, I'm going to ask Frank and Andrew for their final quick comments. Obviously, they can't answer everything, but I really do think this has been a very helpful start. Your book has and the conversations here this weekend. So I don't think this is by any means over. But Frank, for now. And in cricket, they also are trying to abolish sledging, which is where all the fun is. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it, it seems to me that uh, the problem is more complicated than you, you're suggesting, because uh, people who resist the stupidity of this culture, after a while, begin to draw the conclusion that maybe 
maybe they should embrace it. To give you an example, I, I, I go watch football every second week, and when they began to take the knee, people around where I sat and throughout the stadium were hissing and were very angry and were, you know, were really pissed off about people taking their knee. A year and a half on, uh, because it's been normalized and people, they see people on TV you know, sort of clapping their hands, you know, we're doing something virtuous and very, very good, the mood and the reaction to the taking of the knee has changed quite fundamentally. And these are by football fans. And I think that's, I'm not, that's, that's really what you would expect, given the zeitgeist and the cultural pressure. That, they're on. that doesn't mean to say that they're enthusiastic about it, but it means that there is a kind of climate, a dynamic that, that exists, which can influence people from all kinds of backgrounds. Nobody is, unfortunately, nobody is really immune from it. But yet there are signs of fight back. So, for example, I'm a Spurs fan. And as you probably know, we had a, a rule that said that nobody could say Yido you know, or ye, called, use the word Yid, you know, even though that's kind of what we are about. We're all Yids, you know, if you're a Spurs fan. The, the day when that rule came out from the chairman, everybody used the word Yid Army, Yid Army, did not stop for two hours. People just chanted because they wanted to fight back. So there are, these things are very, uh, in a sense, really kind of quite ambiguous. And it's all about the context. We have to think about the context. What's, in, in what context can we most effectively resist and in what context we can make the greatest possible impact? I think that really uh, seems to be, to be quite important. I just want to end on a positive, I know it's difficult, on a positive note. Uh, I do think there are certain values that we can promote that are much easier to uh, get people to, to turn around, to get around. And I think that the values that we should be promoting isn't just free speech, which has been really quite important. I think tolerance is far more important. I think we've got to revisit the Enlightenment idea of tolerance, where we basically uh, accept that people have the right to, uh, to believe in accordance with their inclination. They have the right to their own conscience. And they have the right to you know, be who they are without having to go to a consent workshop. And I think that tolerance is something that we can really work on. It's a way of both protecting ourselves, but also it's a way of calling their bluff. Thank you. Andrew. Yes. Uh, OK, just some final thoughts then on that. Just to clarify, uh, the gentleman mentioned Foucault. Uh, and I was, you know, there are some very fascinating aspects of what Foucault did. And I was very specific to say that actually that was an important point that he made. I was talking about the way that that idea had been misappropriated by the theorists that came in his wake. And because we're being filmed, you can watch it back and check that I did very, very specifically say that. One of the things I write about in the book is the way in which Foucault's ideas have been misappropriated uh, by the, I, I think I say something along the lines, he's not so much their deity as their dancing bear. You know, the early postmodernists had a real, uh, uh, you know, they were attempting to break down meta-narratives uh, you know, a church, establishment, science, you know, this is a meta-narrative, the idea of being on the right side of history. This is their meta-narrative. Foucault would have um, taken the woke to part, apart, I think. You know, I, so I think it's really important that I'm clear on where I'm coming from in that. But yes, I think ultimately, I mean, we come back to this idea of language, and I think it, it, the way through this is to uh, take away their magic spells, you know, their incantations that are that are charming people or fooling people into believing ideas that they wouldn't typically support. Most people in this country are broadly liberal-minded, and they go along with these pernicious ideas thinking that they are supporting liberal values, and they're not. And the, the gentleman raised this, this thing about the precision of the use of language is really, really important. They will come up. You mentioned all the phobias that they have, you know, Islamophobia, transphobia. Uh, they come up with new ones every day. There's one now, vegophobia, by the way, if you're scared of vegans. I don't know why you'd be scared of vegans. <laughs> I mean, they are, I know they're annoying, but... And then, you know, there's a new one, which is NB-phobia, which is if you're af uh, afraid of, um, of non-binary people. I'm not afraid of teenage girls with short haircuts. I, you know, so the thing about this is they are, that is an attempt to pathologize a difference of opinion and to make that opinion not worthy of addressing. And it disobliges you of having to engage with people if you've, if you've effectively said that they're mentally ill. And that's what's going on there. So I think reclaiming language and precision of language is really important. And, and, you know, and to come back to the point that the other gentleman made about, he used the word, I can't remember, it was the other guy in the jacket, he used the word humility. 
And I think that, that word is so important, humility. The, 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 the recognition that there is, there is always a kernel of truth in what your detractors say, even in Robin D'Angelo, which is a terrible book, White Fragility. But critical race theory has a good point at the heart of it, which is how can it be the case that we live in a society where there are legal protections against racial discrimination, but racism still lingers? So that's a good point. I mean, the, 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 the intention behind white fragility and the intention to try and grapple with that is a noble one. She's just wrong about everything in the way that, <laughs> in the way that she does it, but she does get 12 grand an hour to go and berate people in corporations about their white privilege, didn't she? There was a famous uh, talk she gave at Coca-Cola and the big takeaway from that was try to be less white. That was her, I don't know how you do that, like bronzing pearls maybe, I don't know, but, the, but, but so, you know, ultimately, though, the humility is important, and that's what the Puritans of old had. They never knew if they were the elect or the damned. So they, they had to have humility. And the activists of today, the woke activists, don't have that. So I think starting from the premise that although we need to challenge all of this stuff, recognizing that there can be very good intentions within that movement is a really good start. Um, but also understanding that when we argue, when we get into these debates and discussions, we always have to have a recognition that we will be wrong about certain things. Humility, I think, is a really powerful thing, and hopefully that will help us get out of this. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panel.